Okay, George Garrels here. This is part two of our module on uh, uranium lead geochronology using a multi collector ICPMS. In part one, we took a tour of the laboratory here at the University of Arizona, saw the laser, saw the mass spectrometer. In part two here, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uranium lead uh, geochronologic data, the software that we use. And then in uh, part three, we'll do the live tour through the lab and you'll have a chance to ask questions and uh, and see how things are, are actually working in the lab. So let's start off with the, the main interface of our uranium lead data reduction software. This is uh, programmed in MATLAB. The uh, programming was done by Kurt Sundell as part of his postdoc here at uh, the Lasertron Center. And the, uh, the, the nuts and bolts of the data reduction software are what we refer to as age calc. This is a data reduction scheme that I've been working on for Boy, pretty much 20 years now, we started in the early 2000s uh, doing uranium lead geochronology by laser ablation ICPMS. And this is the, the software that's been developing over that 20 year period. Okay, so we'll start off down in the lower left corner here. And what we see here is a list of all of the analyses that we've done for this sample. You can see there's about 160 of them total. And as we talked about in the first part of the presentation, we start off with some standards. These are the primary standards. We analyze those to make sure that we know what the fractionation is for uranium to lead. And then we have a couple of secondary standards here. R33 is our secondary. And then we do five unknowns, a primary, five unknowns, a primary, and we kind of sequence through all of the analyses that way. So this is our run list. And then over here, just to the right of that, is basically a plot that shows the ion intensities for all of the different isotopes that we're interested in for uranium lead geochronology. So remember what those are, 238, which decays to lead 206, so in purple and green, and you can see those have the highest intensity. Uranium up here, this is a log scale, so maybe 30, 40 million counts per second generated for uranium, a little bit less for lead. And then lower in, in intensity, we see 207 lead. Remember, we, we measured both 206 and 207. You do not see uranium-235 on the list here, and that's because we know how much 235 is present once we've measured 238. Remember, it's that ratio 137.82, more 238 than there is 235. So we don't bother measuring 235. 207, 206, we also look at uh, 204. Remember, this is the, the non-radiogenic isotope of lead. This is the one that tells us how much lead was in that crystal at the time of crystallization. And uh, this 204 intensity is very small. We talked about this one being measured with ion counters rather than Faraday's for the other ones. We use these ion counters because they're able to measure very small um, ion intensities. And then recall, we also measure mercury 202. And this is because there's a, an isotope of mercury at the 204 position. And so we want to be able to take the total 204 measured, which is the green trace, subtract uh, from that the 204 mercury, which we get because we know the 202, 204 ratio of mercury in nature. And then we end up with uh, 204, which is only the, the lead isotope. And then we can do that initial lead correction. Okay, so those are the different uh, isotopes we, we're measuring. And we're gonna start off here at time zero. We count basically for about 10 seconds with the laser off, and this is what we call backgrounds. These are the ion intensities that are coming into the collectors when there's no laser firing, no sample being ablated. We fire the laser right here, and you can see rapid, almost instantaneous increase of the uranium and lead signals. We fire the laser continuously. This is the seven hertz per second hit rate, repetition rate. We do that for about 15 seconds. We turn off the laser, and then you can see this rapid washout down back to background values. We let it wash out for a few seconds, and then we start the next analysis. So we would see the next one here. Okay, so what we can look at here are the intensities. We can also look at the isotope ratio, 206, 238 is the one we're interested in for ages. You can see the ratio here, this is backgrounds. Here we fire the laser. And this is a pretty typical pattern for 206, 238. It increases slightly with time, usually kind of a linear increase in 206, 238. 
And that's as we're drilling down into the laser pit, going down about uh, 10 or 12 microns. Uranium is a little bit more sticky, and so it tends to plate out on the pit wall or on the floor of the pit, whereas uh, lead does not. And so the 206 lead to 238 uranium ratio increases with time. Then we turn off the laser, and we see it goes back to uh, background values. Same thing for 206, 207. There's not so much fractionation downhole for 206 and 207. They're both lead isotopes, so they behave very similarly. So that's the powerful aspect of this plot down here in the lower left. It allows you to basically go through and look at the, the analyses for every one of your unknowns. And you're looking for weird patterns like something like this, perhaps. This is a good one to show the, the power of multi-collection. Remember if we have 206 and 238 coming out at the same time from our ablation pit, being measured in the collectors at the same time, it doesn't really matter if there's some instability in that signal because 206 and 238 are going up and down together. So this shows really well the power of, of a multi-collector ICPMS. So you can go through and you could look in all of your analyses here. You can find some that uh, look good. You can find some that look not so good. These are all pretty nice. Let's go down here to one of these. In red, we have the software set up such that if there's something funky about the analysis, it'll turn it red. And so here, let's take a look at this. 238 looks pretty good. 206 looks good. 207 looks good. Oh, but look at 204. You fire the laser and the 204 content goes up. That means there's a fair amount of 204. In this case, it must be lead because mercury stays constant in that crystal. So now we have a, a really large initial lead correction and we don't want to use this analysis. So it shows up here rejected for high 204. Same here. So you can go through and you can look at all the, the red ones and you can decide if, um, if they really should be rejected or not. And you can just change that with the, the button here. So let's look at a good analysis. Here's a good one. And now uh, the plot to the right shows the ages um, that are calculated from the measured 206, 238, 207, 235, and 206, 207. Remember, we have, we have these three different chronometers or clocks. And if all three of those give you exactly the same age, then your analysis sits on top of this line here. This is the line of equal 206, 238, and 207, 235 age. You can see it's not quite right on that Concordia line, but the blue ellipse here, this is the uncertainty ellipse. So within uncertainty, it sits on top of that, that uh, Concordia line. So that we would call that a good analysis. Let's look at another one here. Here's another one, different age, 1430. The uh, software is smart enough to figure out what the, the best age is, 1434, and it gives you the uncertainty for that age. So you can go through and you can look at all of your analyses on the Concordia diagram and uh, make sure that you think that they are reliable analyses. 387 MA for this one. Oh yeah, that looks pretty good. So this plot here is really informative. This is what we call a Concordia diagram and it shows how our three chronometers, we can only see two on here, how they behave relative to each other. Okay, but recall that the isotope ratio that you measure from the mass spectrometer is not actually the true isotope ratio, right? With every mass spectrometer, there's some some mass bias or some fractionation that takes place. In this case, it's significant between 206 and 238. One is lead, one is uranium, one is plus four, one is plus two. They have different size. So because of their different size and, and valence, um, they fractionate, they, they are ionized differently as they come out of the laser pit and move through the mass spectrometer. So what we do is we analyze primary standards. Remember we did five of these primary standards, and then we sequence through primary unknowns, primary unknowns. And what we do is we take the measured age of that primary, and we zoom it back to the true age, and we figure out what the correction is, maybe 10%, 15%. And then we apply that correction to the unknowns, assuming that they behave the same way in terms of uranium lead fractionation. So this upper plot here, this is a plot that shows that fractionation pattern in this case, we'll look at 206, 238. If the primary standard was giving us exactly the true age, this would be 1.00, but of course it's not, it never does. We usually see 10 to 15% fractionation of, of 206 relative to 238. In this case, it looks like it's about 12%. 
You can see our five primaries at the beginning. These five light blue bars represent the first five unknowns, a primary, five unknowns, a primary, five unknowns, and so on. And so we just sequence through all 120 of our unknowns, primaries, maybe one every five through that sequence. And then we also do some secondary standards occasionally. And remember what happens with those secondary standards is that they get corrected as though they were unknowns. And then we can compare the age of those secondary standards to their true age. And that tells us whether our fractionation correction is working appropriately or not. So here's a plot for 206, 238. This is a pretty good run. The blue bars here, they have an uncertainty of 2%. So you can see on this day, looks like we are running about 1% in terms of uh, reproducibility of that, of that primary standard. Here we look at 206, 207. Here's value 1.00, look at this, this is good. They're all set right about at 1.00. And that's the way it should be because 206 and 207 are both lead isotopes. They don't fractionate very much. And so we should come back with kind of a, a, a check on the, on the accuracy of our system uh, with 206, 207 fractionation at about one. And you can see it's reproduced to much better than 2%, probably better than 1% even. Okay, so this upper plot here, this shows the behavior of our primary standards. Now let's take a look at all of our primary standards on a Concordia plot. We could look at each individual one down here. All right, here's one of our primaries. Here's one of our primaries. Now let's look at all of those primary standards and here they are on this Concordia plot up to the upper right. Same axes, 206, 238, one watch. Here's our second chronometer, 207, 235. And mathematically, what we do is we take the average 206, 238, and 206, 207 of all of the primary standard analyses, and we set that to the known age, 1. Uh, 10, sorry, 1099 uh, million years. And then we look at what the correction is to make it sit right on the average, sit right on top of 1099. And so in this case, it's about 12% for 206, 238 and a very slight correction for 206, 207. So these primary standards sit on the Concordia plot right on top of 1099 as they should. Well, let's take a look at our secondary standards and see how they were doing. We know our secondary standard has a true age of 419 MA. Here are the measured secondary standards and their weighted mean age is 417.5. So what is that? That's about 0.3%. Um, about about a quarter of a percent too young. That's pretty good if we're talking about reproducibility of 1%. Here we are, our secondary standard is a quarter of a percent. We would say that's a pretty good analysis. So we, do, we use all of these kinds of uh, plots here um, to kind of look at the data coming off the machine, the, the fractionation correction for the two different uh, chronometers that we're gonna plot here. We can plot them all on Concordia and take a look at our analyses. Everything looks good, so let's have some fun. Let's go look at the unknowns. Now we can look at our plot here, our Concordia plot of the unknowns. And remember we had some accepted ones. Most of them were accepted. We also had some red ones which were rejected. The plot here shows the rejected ones. Look at this one way off of the, our Concordia line. This tells us our two clocks are not giving us the same time we would want to be one little uh, wary of that age, but most of them sit right on top of that one-to-one -one line. So we feel confident that those ages are reliable. Let's look only at the accepted analyses right there. So now we see only the ones that fit our criteria for overlap with the Concordia line. And so this, uh, this tells us basically the range of ages of our sample. It starts off zero here. Of course, as time goes on, you you accumulate more 206, you lose 238, so you go up the curve. You accumulate 207, you lose 235, so you go to the right. And so you work your way out along the Concordia line. Here's 1 billion years, 1.5 billion years, 2 billion years, 2.5 billion years. Remember the age of the earth is 4.5 billion years. So this, this sample has got an interesting range. They go from quite old to sort of middle age, and then some down here that are, that are quite young. So this is a way of, of looking at the age distribution of that sample. It's kind of hard to describe this to someone um, as just a single age for each analysis. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the best age from each of these analyses, and we're gonna plot that. We'll do that first as a histogram. 
So down here in the, in the lower right, now we're gonna do some interpretation of our ages. And what it shows is age of the earth recall is about out here. So we've got some old ones. We've got some lots of middle age zircons. Most of them are about middle age for the earth. And then we've got some younger ones down here. It looks like some younger ones, maybe about 100 million years old. That's getting pretty young. So now we, we have kind of a one dimensional lineup of these ages. This is just a histogram that shows the number of ages that fall within each age bin. We have another curve that we use commonly to show this kind of age distribution. We call this a probability density plot. And it's basically just a smooth version of those histogram bars. And so on this, you can say, oh yeah, it looks like a lot of our ages are right about this age right here. And a lot of them are this age. We have a few young ones, we have a few old ones. And so this P PDP green curve tells you something about the, the sum of that age distribution. And then we can do a little math. We can apply a kernel density estimate. Some people think this is a better representation of that age distribution. You can see it kind of smooths out that distribution a bit more. And so you might use this as the distribution of ages within your sample. And then what you can do is you can take this age distribution and compare it with another age distribution and talk about similarities and differences. You can use these ages then to say something about the, when the rock crystallized, where those zircon grains were coming from. These were clearly coming from a source rock about 1.4 billion years old, 2.7 billion years old, 450 million years old. So that tells us something about the, the origin of the grains that are present in this sample. So this is a, just a quick run through of our AgeCalc software. Um, I think uh, next thing we'll do is we'll start uh, the, the live tour through the lab and this will be your chance to offer uh, some questions and some observations about the lab. And so let's fire up the live tour and do the, do the demo.